Good morning, good morning. Slightly off the beaten track today. Just dropped the grandchildren off at school. Probably gonna be a slightly shorter one today. Dental. This road's a nightmare to get up. Lots of parked cars. I'd say it's probably more of a nightmare to get down. But anyway, anyway. What I'm going to talk to about today is something, again, that you'll never find in any dental textbook. Oh, by the way, I've got a bit of a cough, so let's shut the window. And uh, I apologise if I, if I cough and sneeze a lot. There we go. Yeah, look at that. And it's about um, how to deal with um, racism, sexism, xenophobia in the surgery and I'm not talking about you know staff wise I mean obviously that's a whole other subject and but much less likely to crop up than getting a patient who for example is a racist and knowing how to deal with that so now <clears throat> the other thing I would say uh, I'd qualify by saying that I'm not talking about I'm not going to try and lecture people who may have been the object of racism themselves on how to deal with it. That's not the sort of racism I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the, um, uh, you know, being a, an Indian dentist and then a patient coming in and saying, no, I don't like it. I don't want to be treated by an Indian dentist. That's outside the scope of what I'm talking about, okay? That's a, that's a completely different problem. Well, it's the same problem manifest in a different way. I'm just going to confine myself to talking about what I know about, which is how to deal with patients who express views, let's say, which are unacceptable. Now, uh, and by unacceptable, I don't even mean unacceptable in general. I mean uh, unacceptable to you, you know, and I'm hoping that what is unacceptable to you is also unacceptable in general and vice versa. But let me just give you some quick examples. Um, the patient came in and uh, had just been on holiday, uh, had previously expressed, and we get this a lot in Kent, okay, I think this might be, you know, uh, specific to uh, our area, or at least more, we're, we're more prone to it because we are at the front line of uh, the, the cross-channel boat crossings. And, uh, you know, they'll say like, you know, the, all these, basically, I'm going to summarise this in very crude language because I haven't got much time to go into the sort of the niceties and the way that they paraphrase everything. But in fact, the, the message was basically that, you know, we, we've got too many immigrants, they're putting house prices up, they're taking all the jobs, um, and um, basically, uh, you know, they're all economic refugees and none of them are, um, they're economic migrants and not refugees and therefore um, we don't want them. So I have in a previous uh, podcast covered why the, the government actually does want refugees um, and immigrants because of uh, the um, economic situation in the country. But um, that's again, that's not really relevant to um, what I'm going to be discussing. So, so you've got a patient there who's uh, expressing very strongly a view, um, an uninvited view, I might add, for the most part that, um, you know, what do you think about all these refugees coming across in the boats? So, <clears throat> um, I'll give you another example. We've got a, a patient who comes in who, uh, uh, this is a few years ago now, is may well be of, uh, have a foreign accent, by which I mean like a French or a German or a Dutch or, uh, you know, some sort of a European accent, who expresses quite uh, strongly their desire for the Britain to remain in the European Union and that we will be stupid to come out and uh, they can't understand why we've all collectively gone mad and if we leave the European Union the whole thing will be a disaster not for the European Union but for us but don't we realize that and uh, uh, you get that with people who uh, are off I would say European Union nationals and to a certain extent we used to get it with with very young voters like the 20 22 year old group who are you know quite uh, 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 adopted this 
pro-European narrative. You know, their, their futures, their life would be um, much better off inside if they were able to uh, freely work and travel within the European Union. So they felt very strongly about it. And then lastly, uh, a more recent example of a guy who's um, he's an anti-boat person and gave me a load of that on the first visit and then on the second visit uh, I'd been on holiday and uh, was just remarking about I, I suppose changes he'd seen in his lifetime you know um, and said that he was not used to swimming pools being full of women in full uh, bathing costumes you know from top of their head to the tip of their toes all, all wrapped up and said that they looked like penguins and um, they didn't believe that they were could be hygienic, um, <clears throat> implying that they are in some, in some way, a sort of a dirty uh, people. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I think the first thing you have to do is immediately challenge what they're saying, because you can't come back later and challenge it. You can't, you can't twenty minutes later say, "Oh, and by the way, that what you were talking about, I don't agree with that." You have to call them out straight away on it. So, um, I mean, for example, I mean, uh, Muslims are some of the cleanest people I know. I mean, I would say most Muslims are cleaner than most people in this country. You know, they're talking about a religion where you have to wash four times a day. You know, anyone who's been to a Muslim country knows that. But of course, these people, they, they, you know, they've never been outside the UK for the most part, unless it's been on a Thompson's All Inclusive and. Uh, uh, never travelled to Africa or um, most of the time never been outside the East End uh, so you know you have to tell them that you don't agree with them then if they're if they've got half a brain cell they'll shut up they'll just realize because they're like in the same way as Lord Colwyn used to say to me you know uh, when I met him he said you know he'd ask me questions like um, uh, do, do, uh, do you bring a day shirt to London do you know do you have an evening shirt and a day shirt and I'm like, no, I just, I just wear my shirt, and and then it, he immediately knew that I was not one of him. You know, he's like it's self and non-self. He's like, is that okay? This guy is not in in my particular Venn overlap. And, and they drop these questions to determine that. You know, you're. I've said it before. You go to uh, BDA and it'll be a lecture, and if you uh, pronounce a few names correctly, then you're in. If you pronounce a few names incorrectly, then you, you set yourself out as a as an outsider. And to a certain extent, that's what language and and even regional dialects are all about. It's all about being an insider or an outsider. You're a member of the clan who's worthy of support and help, or you're a member of you're not a member of my clan, and you're worthy of a, a tomahawk in the top of your head. So um, you'll have to read Richard Dawkins to find out what I'm talking about. Why? You know, human beings form clans, and and who you're motivated to uh, be uh, beneficial to, and who you're not. <coughs> so immediately, you know, you identify yourself as not identifying with them, which is a shame, really, because you're not. Um, how can I put it? Let me just give you one more example before I tell you what what my thoughts are on, in terms of how you can sort of resolve this. Um, had another another chap in yesterday, and um, we ended up talking about the um, whether or not the Metropolitan Police should ban marches um, uh, around the Armistice uh, on Armistice Sunday because of this um, hysteria that uh, you know that they were going to basically level the Senate off, and there'll be riots up and down. Uh, uh, up and down Whitehall. Well, I mean, I've lived long enough to see to see riots in Trafalgar Square, so I, I'm not saying that it can't happen. But also, I've lived long enough to have lived through the whole Northern Ireland crisis, and uh, I know that the police understand marches. They're not afraid of them, or don't have the power to deal with them, or anything like that. You know, they they're quite they can quite easily have the Red Party and the Blue Party marching in, at the same time in London. And they know now that the only thing they have to do is keep them apart, you know, just make sure that the, the routes are separate. And for the most part, the, uh, 
the marches I've seen that you know uh, have been relatively peaceful. I'm not saying that they, they haven't been in any arrest, but they've been arrested for um, waving flags of the wrong type rather than uh, than uh, mob violence. Anyway, his attitude was that if they didn't like here, they can all f off back where they came from. So, to which I immediately pointed out that they are, for the most part, peaceful. And they do have some, there is some element of uh, justification for what they're doing, whether or not you agree with them or not. And um, that, uh, uh, I should imagine most of them are, were born in this country anyway, the people on the march. Uh, certainly, it's not a lot of people, I think, who are, were born in this country will, will be there just to, swell the numbers and show some solidarity so you know his idea that uh, he, he then went on to elaborate that um, he didn't think that that sort of process should be allowed because it will never never changes anything it's not going to have any effect and therefore because it's not going to have any effect it, it needs to be it needs to be banned so uh, there there right what <laughs> you've got there is you've got on the one side me who's like a libertarian, a liberal, who's very much in favor of uh, uh, democracy and the right uh, free speech. And someone who I would regard as a, I suppose a fascist is the best way to describe him. I don't know whether, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't put that actually down to racism, but I'd put it down, I would certainly say it's intolerance. Someone who doesn't care about what other people think and thinks that everybody who doesn't think the same way as him should be literally banned from leaving their house. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, when I talk to these people, I've, I'm interested in their arguments, really. I'm not interested in whether they agree with me. I'm not trying to get them to agree with me. I'm trying to find out why they think the way they do. <coughs> and you almost always find out that these people are singularly lacking in any sort of coherent argument for their case. They're just like, they very much fall back on the point where I, I'm entitled to have an opinion. That's my opinion. You may not like it, but I'm entitled to have it. So we're gonna not, we won't agree, you know? And I'm like, okay, no, we won't agree because, but not only that, because I can't see what's the basis for your opinion other than intolerance, you know? You got you don't you're not telling me what that intolerance is based upon. What you're not going to tolerate, you don't want to tolerate it, but you don't know what it is. <clears throat> so, now how do you resolve this? Well, it's it is tricky because um, the guy who's the uh, you know thinks that all uh, that people should be barred from wearing swimming swimming costumes. <coughs> I really toy with the idea of just saying to him, I don't really, you know, we don't, you're a racist. We don't really welcome racists here. Um, and therefore, you know, you're going to need to find yourself another dentist. But then <clears throat> the, the other guy who came in yesterday, the one who was like, oh, well, they can all go back where they came from, was, you know, a sort of a quasi racist, but also more of a, I'd say, it's got a fascist approach to government, which is that, you know, if you're not doing what I want, then then uh, I don't care, you know, if someone shoots you in the head, that's fine by me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm thinking, well, I, if I started delving into people's opinions, then probably I'd have to ban half the patients in the practice, certainly the half that's over 60. Then, so then, then what's the alternative? The alternative is you say that I, we are not going to talk about uh, politics in the surgery. Uh, or we're not going to talk about anything that's non-dental in the surgery. And I think in the end that's the conclusion I'm going to come to. I'm going to have to say to these people, look, you know, uh, you're very welcome to come here to get your teeth fixed, but we are not going to talk anything non-dental in the surgery. Now, can you apply that principle to everybody? I mean, I've had some fantastic conversations with people uh, not on non-dental subjects. And, and I think that's part of the attraction for me. And part of the attraction for most dentists 
who get to know their patients and have a chat with them and talk to them about stuff other than their family and their dog and whatever, you know, I, I do like a little bit of a chat in the surgery. Perhaps that's my problem. I do like to get to know people, but then what, that's the problem is what happens when you get to know people and you don't, don't like what you get. <laughs> and you realize they're not the sort of people you'd want at a dinner party at all. So I think my conclusion is going to have to be, I'll, I will carry on talking to people, but I probably will avoid uh, very contentious subjects such as uh, uh, the current conflict in the Middle East or, uh, you know, or, or uh, Brexit, which at the time was a very contentious subject. And, um, you know, and if people try and bring these things up in a way to determine whether you're with them or a ginnum, uh, I shall have to say, look, I'm sorry, we don't uh, encourage discussion on controversial topics, uh, which is, um, you know, it's just a way, because I don't really want to chuck them all out. I mean, it's not because of the money. I, I'd quite happily chuck those those ones out. I, I wouldn't miss them at all. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, how do you do it? How do you explain to them why you're chucking them out? So I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't send you, I'm not going to send you a checkup appointment or answer your phone calls because you're a racist. It's difficult, isn't it? You know, I'll, uh, I'll just say, uh, I'll, I'll just treat them as normal and then, and then if we go at all off, off piste, I shall just have to say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not even going to answer that question because I don't, but then, you, but then, then you're stuck on you because I said, then you've got to challenge it. If they say, if they say everybody whose surname begins with an S, should go back where their grandparents were born, and and you, and you're like, hmm, okay, okay. You're like, there's a tacit agreement there, isn't there? There's a tacit agreement. So perhaps you've got to say something like, well, I don't agree, and I'm not prepared to discuss it. We'll, we'll invite me out for a pint, and then we'll discuss it, but not when I'm just about to drill your teeth. <laughs> okay, all right, see you soon, bye.